My name is Charlotte Wilson, and I'm a research fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation, and I'm presenting on the anatomical examination of the mandibular condyle intrusion into the middle cranial fossa. Uh, this work has been in conjunction with Dr. Iwanaga, Dr. Skewing, and Dr. Tubbs. Uh, first, I want to go through some of the anatomy related to the temporomandibular joint. The first structure that we'll look at is the mandibular fossa. Let's see if I can use this properly. There we go, which is seen here. And it's made up of this, both the squamous and the tympanic regions of the temporal bone. Uh, it separates the mandibular condyle from the middle cranial fossa. Uh, the thinnest portion of the mandibular fossa is the bony roof with about a mean thickness of 0.9 millimeters in adults, so a relatively thin structure. Uh, the lateral aspect of the mandibular fossa is reinforced by the zygomatic process. The next structure that we'll look at is the condylar process, which is circled here. <clears throat> it's typically oval in shape in adults, and that's something we'll get to uh, in a little bit further. Uh, the condyle is tilted forwards, and it articulates with the mandibular fossa. Oh, gosh. Sorry, my it's not working. Um, next, we'll look at the blood supply to the TMJ. On the medial side, it's supplied by the maxillary artery, and on the lateral side, it's supplied by the superficial temporal artery. It's important to note that the middle meningeal artery is in close proximity to the TMJ, uh, and it also runs on the floor of the middle cranial fossa. And again, this is something that we're going to come back to. Uh, the uh, TMJ is innervated mostly by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, uh, specifically the auricular temporal branch, and uh, that's just important to note. So there are some, or we'll go through the epidemiology. Um, Aria et al. Uh, discovered 56 cases in the English language of intrusion of the mandibular condyle into the middle cranial fossa. Uh, 56, out of 56 of these cases, 51 uh, patients had adequate data for a systematic review. Um, 75 of those occurred in patients younger than 30, and 91% of patients under the age of 15 were female. The most common cause of this injury was either motor, motor vehicle accidents or bike accidents. Um, and there are some pathological explanations as to why this occurs more in children than, than in adults. So we'll go through some of the pathology, some of the explanations as to why this might occur in children more often than adults. Uh, first, we'll look at the condylar head, which can be seen here in the box. In adolescence, the condylar head tends to tends to be more rounded uh, due to an underdevelopment of the medial and lateral poles of the condyle, uh, which ensures a direct contact with the weakest part of the thin bony lamina of the mandibular fossa during a, tra a traumatic event. In adults, however, the condylar head is uh, scroll-shaped with a more defined medial and lateral pole. Uh, this gives it a wider surface area and reduces the pressure on the mandibular fossa during a traumatic event. Next, we'll look at the mandibular neck. I don't know why my computers decide not to work. Sorry. Um, in adolescence, the mandibular neck tends to be uh, thicker and shorter. And this gives it added strength um, during such an event and increases the risks of it fracturing the mandibular fossa. In adults, however, the neck is much thinner and elongated, and that's more likely to fracture than it puncturing the mandibular fossa. So we recreated the fracture within the lab. Um, this is a superior view of the fracture with the dura still intact. And as I mentioned previously, the middle meningeal artery cross, uh, crosses over the floor of the middle cranial fossa, which is indicated by the red arrows here. So that is the middle meningeal artery arising from foramen spinosum. And that's before the fracture. After the fracture was recreated, you can see here outlined by these purple dots, you can see how the middle meningeal artery passes right across that fracture line. And it's at a high risk for injury during such an event. Um, injury to the middle meningeal artery could result in an epidural hematoma, which is extremely important to note. So we dissected further, um, and for reference, this 
blue shaded area is the fractured area and you can see all the associated structures surrounding the fractured area there from reports of hearing lost due to damage to the eighth cranial nerve which can be seen here and you can see it's close proximity to the fracture there have also been reports of damage to the ossicles of the middle ear which can also be seen here so the malleus and incus and its close relationship to the fractured area uh, there have also been reports of blood in the external auditory canal, uh, preauricular pain, and triasmus. Um, again, you can see how close the canal is to the fractured line. And again, for reference, the middle meningeal artery has been cut, but you can see it's close proximity to where the fracture was recreated. Um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> There have also been reports of asymmetric shortening of the mandibular ramus, deviation of the mandible, and interior open bite in cases. Uh, because these symptoms may also be present in condylar fracture, plain tomography or CT scans are extremely advantageous for uh, determining if this is a condylar intrusion into the middle cranial fossa. Unfortunately, my PowerPoint has given up on me, but um, I want to say thank you to all of you guys. Um, Thank you, Dr. Tubbs, for an incredible opportunity here. Dr. Ibanaga, Kevin, all of you guys, this has been one of the best experiences of my life. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah.